The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Leading the Change in Hemophilia A, Guidance on Enhancing Prophylactic Care with Innovative Extended Half-Life Factor 8 Products. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash WEM860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. <laughs> Bonjour. I'm so glad that you have decided to kick off your ISTH 2023 by joining us at uh, the symposium today entitled Leading the Change in Hemophilia A, uh, where we're going to hopefully provide some guidance to you on enhancing prophylactic care with innovative extended half-life factor A products. I'm Stephen Pipe from the University of Michigan in the U.S., and joining me today is Marie Elisa Mancuso uh, from Milan, uh, Italy. Genes for factor eight and factor nine were cloned uh, in the 1980s. And since then, this has opened up uh, a platform of uh, innovation in recombinant therapy uh, to bring new uh, and innovative therapies uh, to the clinic. And not only do we have uh, recombinant versions of factor eight and factor nine, but we've uh, had additional uh, conjugations and uh, modifications of these recombinant molecules that have brought extended half-life factor eight and factor nine that we've now been using for about uh, 10 years. Uh, we are now also in an era uh, where, uh, at least in my country and uh, maybe in many parts of the EU, uh, the dominant prophylactic prescribed therapy is actually a non-factor therapy, uh, emicizumab, and we're well into about five years of commercial use of this therapy. But what we're gonna introduce today uh, is a von Willebrand factor independent extended half-life recombinant factor eight. And you're going to hear uh, more about this uh, over the course of this hour. It's been 16 years uh, since we had the definitive uh, randomized control trial demonstrating the superiority of prophylaxis uh, as compared to on-demand or episodic factor replacement therapy. And uh, this applies to all age groups that it's, it's applied to. And it has been key to the prevention of joint disease. And uh, just to remind you of this data from the original uh, Mako Johnson uh, paper in 2007, the New England Journal, uh, but you can see across uh, the toddler age group, um, uh, prophylaxis uh, group uh, is indicated in the, uh, in the uh, black and in the uh, lighter blue. Uh, for both joint hemorrhages and uh, other hemorrhages. And uh, you can compare that to uh, episodic therapy, again, in uh, orange and green for joint hemorrhages and other hemorrhages. And it's, it's stark, the contrast of the impact of uh, prophylaxis. Uh, however, the, um, I, I guess the, the rest of the story is that we have the follow-up uh, from this paper, whereas these toddlers grew up into adulthood um, that even prophylactic therapy as applied during that era was not able to completely abrogate all joint disease uh, as these uh, toddlers uh, approached adulthood. Now, the, the recently updated uh, WFH guidelines for factor prophylaxis and hemophilia A management uh, highlight some important, um, um, I guess, new strategies for prophylactic care. Prophylaxis is indicated for all patients everywhere who have a severe bleeding type. And this is irrespective of their laboratory assigned severity. Uh, the WFH also recommends targeting trough levels uh, that are higher than have been traditionally used now in the three to 5% range. Uh, routine scheduled dosing typically ranges from every other day to two to three times per week, although children will require more frequent uh, dosing than adults. And now uh, we've been able to incorporate different uh, tools to enhance tailoring uh, dose and uh, the dose schedules based on uh, weight and individual drug metabolism. So that the whole concept of pharmacokinetic monitoring is now part of our routine care. And the benefits uh, of, of applying these strategies is reducing the number of bleeding episodes and enhancing joint protection. Now of the extended half-life factory products that have been approved, uh, we see a number of different uh, modif modifications, fusion proteins, as well as uh, conjugations that are listed here, uh, primarily through uh, additional polyethylene glycol. 
um, the half-life extension from these uh, previous strategies have been perhaps somewhat modest, a range of about 1.3 to about 1.8 fold uh, as a comparator to the unmodified uh, molecules. You can see that um, there's a, a mixture of uh, fixed dosing and fixed interval, uh, as well as some uh, tailored uh, dosing and intervals depending on the patient's response. Uh, overall, uh, the efficacy has shown that these are all highly effective when used as prophylaxis, and annualized bleed rates are significantly improved when you compare to uh, patients who are not on prophylaxis. And generally, these have been well tolerated with no unexpected safety issues. No evidence that any of these uh, modifications have increased the risk uh, uh, for inhibitors, and so this is no barrier to switching. What we're going to be talking about today a little bit more is the, the, uh, a new class of extended half-life factor eight product, uh, Phanisoctocog Alpha. Now, currently, this is only approved in the U.S., uh, but this has a substantially uh, increased uh, half-life, and we'll, we'll walk you through uh, how that uh, is derived related to the, the VW and independence of this molecule. But it allows for a fixed dosing at 50 units per kilo once weekly, for all patients and all ages. Now, why are we striving to develop uh, new innovations uh, in fat replacement? Well, some of the unmet needs, there are uh, ongoing barriers to the adoption of prophylaxis, poor adherence to prophylactic regimens, even amongst those who are on regular prophylaxis. Um, we do continue to see recurrent bleeds despite prophylactic therapy. And of course, health inequities exist uh, across the world um, relying on uh, factor replacement therapy. We also have expectations for better care from our patients, uh, from our clinic care staff. Uh, we would like to see prophylaxis for all patients who at least have a relevant bleeding uh, phenotype, um, improved adherence to treatment. Uh, we are striving towards zero bleeds, particularly joint bleeds, and uh, it, it's thought that this is going to be key if we are going to prevent uh, all joint damage later in life. And we also want to enable persons with hemophilia A to live active lives, at least similar to their non-hemophilic uh, individuals, so allowing them to live the life that they choose. Now, we're all familiar with the challenges of pro uh, prophylaxis. The peaks and troughs of this strategy of therapy uh, is particularly a, a limitation of the standard half-life uh, recombinant factor eight molecules. Half-life of factor eight's about eight to uh, maybe up to 12 hours, depending on the individual. Uh, but doing an infusion about every four half-lives means redosing about every 48 to 72 hours. And with this regimen in indicated in the blue are the periods of time when patients are probably at risk uh, for uh, breakthrough bleeding because their factor levels are dropping perhaps below uh, critical dose levels. The extended half-life molecules do uh, offer the ability to extend the interval, uh, but when they're used in this way exclusively, it's still presents a period of time when patients are below uh, critical levels potentially. I, I know at least in our, our clinical experience, we have leveraged the EHL factor eights often uh, with regimens that look very similar to the standard half-life, but it's allowed for higher trough levels to enhance uh, joint protection. If patients are asked, why do you want to switch, or what was your motivation to switch from a standard half-life to an extended half-life product, you can see um, uh, some that are listed here for both adults as well as uh, uh, parents of children. And certainly the longer half-life, the dosing interval, um, some uh, uh, ease with which patients can travel with these products, um, the fact that there really was no uh, new safety issues identified with these new molecules. There are some differences, however, in the motivations b uh, between parents of uh, children versus uh, adults. Um, adults seem to be a little bit more interested in uh, the longer stability of pr these products. Uh, pedi uh, those uh, parents of pediatric age group uh, may be interested more in the benefits of these molecules as it impacts their children's ability to participate in sporting activities. So our goals for today, we want to enhance your understanding of the mechanisms of extended half-life factor eight products in hemophilia A, as well as the evidence supporting their use in prophylaxis. We want to provide you also with the skills that you need to utilize personalized prophylactic regimens using these agents for individuals who he may, and then ensure that you're prepared to address the practical aspects of hemophilia A care. Um, 
how you would incorporate using these products in your education of patients, um, uh, how you monitor them, uh, and uh, how you can use these newer extended half-life recombinant factor eight strategies uh, in your own practice. Now to kick off our uh, symposium today, um, I'm pleased uh, that we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Maria Lisa Mancuso, who's going to give us a master class on understanding the, the mechanistic safety and efficacy differences among the extended half-life uh, factor eight products. Uh, she's a senior hematology consultant uh, from the Humanitas uh, University in uh, Milan, Italy, and I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation, Maria Lisa. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to Peerview for having organized this uh, symposium, and thank you all for being here today. So in the next uh, 10 to 12 minutes, yes, we will go through the mechanism and the clinical impact of the use of extended half-life product in prophylaxis in patients with hemophilia A. Indeed, I have to say that looking at the revolution of therapy for hemophilia A patients in the last decades, Extended Half-Life products uh, represent the first real step forward in order to provide prophylaxis to vast majority of our patients and to have the opportunity to individualize treatment. And we will see how important this uh, word, I would say this key word in treatment of hemophilia A patient is. So we move to uh, looking at the mechanism through which Extended Half-Life products have been uh, engineered. And here you can see that essentially for factor eight, we have three main technologies adopted to improve the PK profile of factor eight. First of all, FC fusion. So the fusion with the FC fragment of immune globulins that nowadays includes two products, f and f and methanes alpha. And albumin fusion is indeed possible with the coagulation factors, but it has been used only to prolong the uh, half-life of factor nine. And then we have pegylation, so the conjugation with polyethylene glycol uh, that may occur with different uh, uh, approaches. We have glycopegylation, which means that the peg moiety is attached to the glycans of the B domain of factor eight. In this product, turoctocog alpha pegyl, which retains a fragment of uh, a B, the B domain, so it's a B domain truncated factor eight molecule, or it can occur uh, directly on uh, the protein um, through random pegylation, so without driving the pegylation on a precise site on the amino acid sequence or a site-specific pegylation. That means that uh, the amino acid sequence is uh, slightly modified in order to have the peg attached uh, exactly on a site. And this has been applied for reotocog alpha pegyl, the, the random pegylation, and the site-specific pegylation in, on the monoptocog alpha pegyl. But what, how these translate in enhancing or the improvement of the PK profile of such molecule? As already Professor Pipe addressed, in the end, the result is indeed an improvement in the PK profile, which we are used to depict through terminal half-life. But I would like to remind you that terminal half-life is just a surrogate marker of the real enhancing and improvement of PK profile we, for which the main uh, um, the parameter that should be taken into account is clearance, first of all, and the area under the curve that we are able to generate when we inject factor eight to our patients. Anyhow, if we look at the terminal of life, you see that we, uh, through th those technologies, we are able to prolong uh, uh, up to 1.5, up uh, 1.8 folds as compared with standard half-life products. And if we consider such PK uh, profile and we target a trough level of 1-3% that we nowadays know, it, which is pretty much obsolete and not really the, the, the target trough level that we want to achieve. Anyhow, in this uh, situation, we can even re uh, reduce the number of injection during prophylaxis by 30 to 35%. And we can get, we, we already can um, obtain a transformation of the uh, bleeding phenotype of our severe patients into the moderate range. We will see that maybe we are already a step forward, but this just to understand which is the uh, impact on the PK profile and how these uh, translate in how we use practically those products. We have different treatment schedule in the label for those products. And I would like to underline that indeed the difference in the treatment schedule is strictly related to the study aim and design through which those molecules have been licensed. 
um, because they are all different. And for instance, the f alpha study um, offered patient individualized prophylaxis in order to target a trough level of 1-3%. So the, the label that we have today reflects what has been used in that study to get to, those tra to the, that draft level. For the Moctococcal alpha pegol in the study design, what, what meant most was the bleeding phenotype of patient, which is another variable very important to be taken into account to, uh, to do e treatment individualization. So in that trial, irrespective of trough levels, patients have been treated in order to get the best out of bleeding frequency in terms of abolishing bleeding frequency at all. And for the other two products, you will find a fixed dosing regimen because the aim was to protect as much as possible and offering, let's say, an easy regimen that could be followed. And so in that way, enhancing the adherence of patients to prophylaxis. Uh, on the whole, if we look at the average clinical impact of, of extended half-life product, I would say that we can disfruit the flexibility of such molecules, uh, adjusting the treatment to the individual needs of each patient, which, which means that we can meet both clinical needs, but also uh, needs that are related to their preference or their lifestyle. And here in this slide, you can see depicted, let's say the extremes of the wide range of the schedule that we can offer. On one side, uh, you can reduce uh, significantly the number of injections, offering a very easy regimen for those patients who have issues with venous success, or maybe those who were reluctant to be injected frequently and maybe refused for years prophylaxis. So with extended half-life products, we also have the chance to uh, convince, let's say, patients that prophylaxis should be the way to go. On the other side, you have the other extreme of the wide range, which is maintaining the same regimen that we use with standard product, but, but using an extended half-life product, you can uh, achieve and maintain very high level of protection. And this is particularly useful in those patients who on one side may have issues with the joint status. I mean, patients with active synovitis or target joints, they do need a better protection in order to solve the joint problem. Or on the other side, maybe patients who are really doing well with the joints and for this reason they are very active both during their work academic career or because they are very sporty and active so as you can see maybe uh, the right receipt is in the middle of that so combining the advantage of having a reduction of the injection and a good protection and uh, uh, also real-world data tells us and show us that PK-guided uh, prophylaxis can be a good way to offer treatment individualization to achieve better outcomes and also maybe to uh, allocate in a good way healthcare resources. Because if you tailor treatment to the individual need, also considering the individual PK response, you also uh, may avoid to wasting product. And there are many tools that can help us as clinicians to uh, understand which is the PK response of each individual and maybe also help us to explain the patient why we are doing something and why his, his, his better treatment schedule is exactly that one and not another one. I have to say that, uh, of course, the PK profile is just a piece of, of the puzzle and we should take in, into account very different variables. And that individualization is key, has been already demonstrated in this trial with f alpha. As you can see, patients could have been treated with different prophylactic regimen, but the group that did the best was the one treated with individualized prophylaxis. Uh, however, we also take into account, we should take into account that PK is not the only variable and bleeding phenotype matters. So knowing well which is the bleeding phenotype of each individual may help us also to offer the best prophylaxis regimen to each patient. And in this trial, uh, indeed patients have been allocated to receive different regimen according not really to their PK profile, but to their uh, pre-existing bleeding phenotype. So the combination of all of those variables allow us to tailor treatment to the individual needs. Uh, in this uh, uh, other experience with Duroctopil, I think that we can also underline how important is adherence to treatment. Providing some patients with a fixed regimen without changing the dosing and the interval 
we may also achieve a very good adherence, which is reflected by the fact that ABR and the proportion of non-bleeders that you can see in this graph is pretty much consistent over time. And the, the longer you go, the better you get if prophylaxis is done properly by patients. And uh, we maybe, uh, as I mentioned, we don't we already overcome the, let's say, the trough level, and we went already beyond the trough, le the old trough level of one three percent. We we are now mentioning three five. Maybe the the next step forward is to go to the mild range, and we are already in this era. This is a study done with Ruryoktokog alpha pegl when the investigator tried to uh, reach uh, a trough in the mild range. Of course, in terms of clinical impact, this was meaningful because. Patients had low bleeding rates and the high proportion of them never bled during the trial. However, we have also, all, also to consider that some patients may pay the price of a very intensive treatment regimen because in this study, 12% of them should have been treated daily to achieve such outcomes. So still something to optimize and to adjust. And uh, we can also address the mild range using non-factor replacement therapy. We know that for emicizumab is able to activate coagulation in the mild range. Uh, we are struggling about which is the, sur the, 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 um, the factor 8 activity that may mimic the activity of EMI, 10, 15, 20, 25. Maybe all those numbers are true on an individual basis. Anyhow, we know that we are getting good clinical impact in terms of bleeding frequency, in terms of patients who do not bleed. But the, dif the main difference is that those patients never have a no normalization of coagulation, something that we can get by modulating and using factor eight. This is the main difference between those products that we should take into account by using those uh, different um, treatment approach. And this is depicted in this graph. So by using factor eight replacement, we can uh, also achieve a, a, and maintain normal levels and we can modulate. This, with non-factor therapies, we may have a good clinical impact, but at the coagulation level, we still, we, we stay consistently in the mild range of anostatic potential. And about safety, uh, data from registries, but also from real-world evidence tells us, with very robust evidence, that switching to extended half-life product is not an additional risk factor for inhibitor development. So we have not this fear, and the safety profile is pretty much good. So to conclude, I have to say that, of course, uh, a standard life products gives us the opportunity to offer a feasible and individualized treatment to patients with hemophilia A in terms of uh, feasible and easy treatment regimen, but with a very good protection level that can be modulated and tailored to the individual needs, which may change even in the same patient over his life. So we can modulate and we have this flexibility to adjust prophylaxis to the different needs in different, maybe also period of life of the single patient. This, of course, is reflected also in improved quality of life and maybe achieving much more this uh, similarity with non-hemophilic peers. And uh, there are some considerations so that we can do about the use of prophylaxis with extended half-life product in hemophilia A. For sure, those, those products allow us to enlarge the number on prophylaxis and also to meet some needs and reduce the treatment burden. This is pretty much true also for non-factor therapies, because if we think about the difficult venous success, poor adherence, the need for a higher protection, this can be achieved also with non-factor. But as I mentioned, we learned by experience that transforming a severe in a moderate is, was not enough. We are now looking at the mild range, but maybe in some cases, even going from severe to mild cannot be enough, especially if we are getting rid from this normalization. So we are not uh, offering our patient a time spent in the normal range. So looking at this new paradigm, maybe the future, uh, the near future, or maybe already is reality, we can offer this. And uh, for that, I hand over again to uh, Professor Pipe to go with his presentation on this new product. Thank you, Steve. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marie-Lisa, for uh, uh, updating us on uh, 
these mechanisms and also their utilization in, in uh, clinical practice. I want to talk to you next about breaking the von Willebrand factor imposed ceiling uh, with current generations of uh, factor A products. So let's make sure we're all, all understanding the ceiling effect that's imposed on factor VIII uh, pharmacokinetics by its affinity for von Willebrand factor. So factor VIII circulates in a dynamic equilibrium uh, uh, with uh, von Willebrand factor, and von Willebrand factor being in massive excess to the concentration of factor VIII in the plasma. And what that means, it's a, it's a very tight affinity that with a, 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 a KD of a 0.2 nanomolar. So that means that the vast majority of the factor VIII in the plasma, 95 to 97%, is bound at any given time to von Willebrand factor and a very uh, small minority, maybe 3 to 5%, that exists in the free form. Of course, the free form is going to be subject to uh, uh, VWF independent clearance because it's not bound to VWF. But all of the factor VIII that is bound to von Willebrand factor will also be subject to the clearance mechanisms that are being driven by von Willebrand factor binding to uh, clearance receptors. So if we want to increase the half-life of recombinant factor VIII beyond the ceiling, it ultimately would be dependent on decoupling factor VIII from binding to at least endogenous von Willebrand factor. So where is this clearance occurring? Um, uh, data has now uh, shown that uh, some of the clearance receptors are derived from uh, liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, uh, macrophages, as well as hepatocytes. And some of those uh, clearance receptors uh, have been uh, teased out from, from recent studies. Again, the free factor VIII um, is going to be unhindered in interaction with these receptors, and that's going to drive that rapid clearance. Uh, but uh, even the bound material, uh, von Willebrand factor, is interacting with uh, these clearance receptors, and uh, factor VIII is uh, being cleared along with von Willebrand factor by these mechanisms. We also know that um, much of the in inter-individual variability in factor VIII half-life is driven by the affinity for von Willebrand factor, the von Willebrand factor levels in the plasma, and perhaps some component of some inter-individual variability of the expression are the interaction of factor VIII uh, with these clearance receptors. So if we can decouple factor VIII from binding to v endogenous VWF, we may also be able to uh, basically even out the inter-individual variability between patients. So this new class of extended half-life factor VIII uh, uh, that's independent of von Willebrand factor uh, is a phanisoctocog uh, alpha. And so uh, this uh, uh, Base molecule is the uh, FC domain uh, fusion, which extends the half-life of uh, factor VIII uh, through interaction with the neonatal FC receptor uh, recycling pathway. But um, in addition, the, the biggest innovation for this molecule is coupling uh, this factor VIII through covalent leakage with a recombinant uh, fragment, the D'D3 prime D3, uh, uh, fragment uh, of uh, von Willebrand factor, uh, which, when it's uh, coupled to factor VIII, this prevents binding to endogenous von Willebrand factor, so it can decouple it from its VWF-mediated clearance, and it also provides partial protection from degradation that would normally be uh, afforded by binding to the endogenous VWF. In addition, uh, this molecule includes um, uh, the X X10, XTEN uh, polypeptides. These are hydrophilic repeating sequences uh, that comprise naturally occurring amino acids, and they help shield the protein from proteolytic degradation and binding to clearance receptors. Uh, now, in that form, uh, this is a non-active factor VIII molecule, uh, but with normal activation of coagulation and generation of thrombin, uh, uh, thrombin cleavage sites have been uh, added in, which enables complete release of the D'D3 prime component and the X10 um, so that the, the intact, activated, FC-fused factor VIII is then available uh, for activity within the coagulation cascade. If we look at the impact of these modifications on the pharmacokinetics, it's impressive. The Phanisoctor Cog Alpha had a three- to four-fold longer elimination half-life and a three- to six-fold greater exposure as compared to standard half-life factor VIII 
or uh, a um, extended half-life uh, pegylated form. Um, the uh, Aphanisoctor uh, alpha also provided high sustained factor eight activity that was in the normal to near normal range, so above uh, 40 IUs per deciliter for up to four days with a, uh, a single uh, weekly dose at 50 IUs per kilo. And if we look at the trough levels now, uh, we are in that mild range that uh, Maria Lisa presented to us uh, with um, uh, mean uh, factor levels of about uh, 10 IUs per deciliter on day seven. So what would, what's the clinical impact? So this was studied in the recently published phase three extend one study. Uh, now this had two arms in uh, patients uh, who are adolescents and adults with severe hemophilia A. Uh, they had previously been on a uh, factor eight uh, prophylactic strategy. So we have their baseline uh, uh, experience, uh, the number of infusions they were using, the annualized bleed rates, et cetera. And the two groups were uh, either placed directly onto once weekly prophylaxis at 50 IUs per kilo, or they were uh, just uh, offered on demand uh, phanisoctocog, and then uh, subsequently they were switched to the uh, weekly res regimen. You can see the primary endpoints here is annualized bleed rate in the prophylaxis treatment arm, but there were also some key secondary endpoints for looking at intrapatient comparison uh, of the ABR during prophylaxis in the A group, which is the prophy group as compared to their pre-study factory profi, and then additional endpoints including how bleeding episodes were treated, safety, PK, and then uh, changes in uh, uh, assessments of physical health, pain, and joint health. So this is the, the, uh, the uh, primary uh, endpoint uh, which met the goal of the study. So in patients who were on the prophylaxis arm, the group A patients, the median ABR was zero and the estimated mean ABR was 0.71. And if we look at the proportion of patients who experienced zero bleeding episodes while on prophylaxis, it was 65% of the patients. So here, if we look at the uh, intrapatient ABR, uh, noting that we had um, uh, collected data on their pre-study factory prophylaxis, the estimated mean ABR uh, prior to going on a phanisoctocog alpha was about an ABR of 2.96. And you can see that there was a 77% reduction uh, after switching to once weekly aphanisoctocog. Uh, no development of uh, inhibitors uh, through this switch was observed in the study. What about some of the additional endpoints? So uh, physical health was assessed with a PRO tool using the hemoqual. Uh, pain was uh, uh, assessed using the uh, PROMISE uh, pain intensity tool. And then joint health was evaluated with the HGHS uh, uh, total score evaluation. And you can see that there were um, uh, meaningful improvements in both physical health, uh, pain readouts, as well as overall joint health. From a safety perspective, we mentioned no development of inhibitors, but also no reports of any serious allergic reactions, anaphylactic episodes, or any thrombotic events. The most common adverse events uh, were uh, typically seen in uh, trials such as these headache, arthralgia, um, uh, falls, as well as um, um, back pain. Um, 11 patients were positive for pre-existing anti-drug antibodies before they received any aphanisoctocog alpha, but there was no discernible effect on PK variables uh, assessed in comparison with the antibody negative uh, population. And I would just do a call out to a couple of additional updates um, coming uh, from the clinical development program. So what we can conclude from the EXTEND study is that this is the first recombinant factor eight to break the VDEBF imposed ceiling for plasma half-life. Once weekly dosing provided superior bleed protection compared with pre-study factor eight prophylaxis. Um, the phanisoctocog maintains normal to near normal factor eight plasma levels for the majority of a week after a single infusion. And we've seen improved uh, uh, PK is also associated with improvements in physical health, pain, and joint health evaluations. Overall, this was safe, well-tolerated, and did not increase the risk of inhibitors. So what we're going to go to next is um, uh, Maria Lisa and I are going to um, address two cases that I think uh, are give us an opportunity for some exchange about the practical aspect of dealing with clinical scenarios uh, that show up in the clinic. So the first one we're going to go to, I'll have uh, Maria Lisa walk through, again, that 51-year-old gentleman. So yeah. tell us a little bit more. 
Thank you. Yes. So I just share this case. Uh, Paul is a 51 year old man with severe hemophilia A. He had no family history of hemophilia and no personal history of inhibitors. And since early childhood, since he was born in an era where pro when prophylaxis was not that widespread uh, used, in, at least in our country, he already experienced several joint bleeds. And he also got hepatitis C, as many uh, peers uh, with hemophilia, uh, that fortunately have been eradicated with antiviral therapy. And due to the several joint bleeds that he had during childhood, he already developed multiple joint arthropathy. And at elbows, knees, and for the knees, he already underwent bilateral total knee replacement, as usual in those patients and in the ankles. So if we look at his treatment history, he received basically on-demand factor A treatment during childhood. Then, as soon as it was recognized that prophylaxis, of course, does better, he switched to prophy during adolescence. And then, um, in the, during adulthood, as soon as emicizumab was uh, available, he switched uh, mainly because, I mean, he was very compliant and adherent to factor VIII prophylaxis, but he had uh, objective limitations to, and barriers to that, which were problems with poor venous access. In adult patients, sometimes it's uh, a real burden. And uh, per really perceived the treatment burden related to the, uh, let's say, uh, missed injection or the fact that it was very difficult to inject. After one, one and a half year of effective, very effective emicizumab prophylaxis, he started to have some bleeding issue. Uh, he had hematuria, but uh, we had a, an explanation for that because he had severe kidney stones and uh, he also bled from uh, a gastric ulcer. However, in the last months, he started to have recurrent elbow bleeds in the elbow that uh, annoying, was annoying him a, a lot. Uh, also in the past, and he collected, let's say, three episodes in four months, which means that he developed a target joint. So this is the story of Paul, and uh, I would like to ask you, Steve, so do you think that this patient would benefit to switch back to replacement therapy? Well, maybe. Um, I wouldn't be so quick to switch him off his current platform of therapy. I mean, as you indicated, you know, the poor venous access and the treatment burden in the past, these are not insignificant. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a little bit bothered by the progression of a, a, target jo a new target joint appearing on emicizumab. This is not something that was typically observed in any of the clinical trials to date. Uh, what we would do at our center is we would use a human um, chromogenic factor eight assay I'd like some ballpark figure of what his, that would be served as a surrogate of his emicizumab yeah. level. And I'd like to see that he is not, doesn't have an unusually low level. Um, there has been a clinical trial experience with dose up titration of uh, emicizumab. So I don't know what uh, regimen he was on, but let's say he was on the 1.5 weekly. Um, you have the option to go up to the three mg per yeah. kilo dosing. Might be worth to see if that has any benefit for him. But even there, um, you know, we're not really changing the, um, he's still mild phenotype. And I don't like this bleeding. I, I don't like the, the gastric ulcer bleeding. I don't like the progression of the target joints. He's got pretty uh, active joints going on here. I think this goes back to your point about the benefits of normalization um, of, of factor levels. And maybe that could have something to play here to get better control. And so the fact that uh, if, if it was available to him to have access to, you know, a phanisoctocog, um, again, we'd have to incorporate discussions about patient preference here. This does mean going back to IV infusions, but it's only once a week. Yeah. Um, worth it, worth so a trial. You're mentioning that, of course, if you consider the role, let's say, of normalization with factor eight, you would favor an extended of life indeed. Or a patient like that. I think in his case, for sure, for all the reasons we talked about. But okay. if I was going to go to an extended half life, um, I think given his profile here, the least burdensome regimen and the optimizing the periods of time that he stays in the normal range is all benefit for him. Yes, but you know, I also put another question because I do think that we also have to take into account the whole because prophylaxis is just one piece of the puzzle. And of course, since he had some problem with the elbow, do you think there is a role also for an, you know, orthopedic evaluation and assessment to better understand? Because, you know, if he bled from the GI and, of course, we looked for a cause for this GI bleed, 
Is that the same also for the elbow? Or you just uh, attribute that to the, let's say, low protection uh, uh, provided by the yeah. tattoo? No, no, I fully agree. I mean, I think having some insights on what's going on in that elbow and also trying to understand what's driving the elbow deterioration. I see that he had, you know, bilateral total knees. Um, has he had some dysfunction? related to his prior uh, arthrodesis or his prior arthroplasty. And uh, is, he, is he using a crutch? Is he using a cane? And is that putting more pressure on his elbow? So, so those are additional things we'd want to ask about. And indeed, you know, uh, I mean, what we provide, I mean, we discussed also, of course, with the patient. I have to say that maybe the second point should be switched because, of course, the first thing we did is we tried to understand if there was an orthopedic issue in that elbow and indeed uh, he had this elbow but you know the situation was not that changed that much from the past uh, the, the past assessment and uh, uh, but you know it was uh, of course for us important to see if there was a new cause for these recurrent bleeds and to consider some orthopedic procedures that may help us together with op prophylaxis optimization to uh, improve uh, his uh, uh, joint situation and of course, you know, physiotherapy also has a role in this setting. So not just looking at the, uh, let's say, drug regimen he's on, but also try to understand on the whole. But in the end, he switched back indeed to factor prophylaxis. He already knows factor eight, how factor eight works because he was on factor eight in the past. Yeah. But nowadays he has the opportunity to disfruit maybe some uh, time spent, longer time spent, on the normal range, which of course with the Ephanesoctogog you showed beautifully that is feasible very easily. But we have to mention with extended half life products, we can provide yeah. such protection at large. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to present a case uh, to you that's a little bit more familiar to me. So here's a 22 year old patient with Hime, um, severe, uh, no history of inhibitors. Um, he's been on standard half-life factory prophylaxis since he was a young infant. Um, and really, he has not complained uh, throughout, you know, even through adolescence about the burden of injections. He just incorporated this into his life, um, basically doing every other day infusion very consistently. Um, and I would say his bleed control overall pr pretty, pretty good, actually. But um, he's gone to college. He's met some new friends. And he's interested in taking up mountain biking. So this is not just road biking. This is, you know, bikes going down mountainsides, okay, at high speeds. So he wants to have a conversation with me about, okay, Dr. Pipe, do you think my current regimen is suitable for this level of activity? And there's no question I had some concerns. So how would you initiate evaluating him? And I think that the first question I put, how would you best evaluate his current prophylactic protection and whether that identifies some gaps where he may have some uh, bleed challenges related to this new activity. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned before, of course, we have different tools. First of all, we can, of course, study his individual response to the product. I mean, looking at this PK profile, because there is variability and even using the same molecule, different patients may respond in a different way. So, of course, assessing how he's responding and looking at his PK profile. I would take into account also his bleeding phenotype. I mean, if he's, he's an heavy bleeder historically or a mild bleeder, this also may uh, let me understand, let's say, the extent of protection he may need or how he could behave do, during mountain biking uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of risk. But anyhow, I think the first thing is to look at the PK profile and maybe also discuss with him um, the opportunity to spend some of the time at risk, let's say, under a boot protection level, not, not just looking at the trough, but looking maybe at the time spent above a certain level rather than just reaching a trough. So um, he's been on the same product for 20 years. Um, and would you switch him to an EHL um, or would you say, what about emicizumab in this context? You know, considering what you told us about the case, uh, he, he was very well controlled. So I would say that both uh, choices could be feasible for him because we have data on patients switching to non-factor therapy that were doing very good uh, with factor 8 and maintained or even improved 
their clinical impact on that. So I would discuss with him both, uh, both uh, uh, alternative, maybe uh, explaining very well the, the difference of mechanism of action and, uh, you know, despite maybe reaching the same clinical impact in terms of bleeding frequency, bleeding risk, in short term, also highlighting the differences. So, so the fact that with non-factor, we maintain this very consistent steady state, very consistent hemostatic potential, but always on the same level. So, so to that point, do you have any concerns? If he, if, if he made a switch to emicizumab with this particular activity, what concerns do you think you would have about him being on emicizumab? Uh, you know, that being always on the mild range, it may happen. I, I cannot say that it's 100% sure, but it may happen that after a trauma, he may develop a severe bleed. Mm. Then we have also some data telling us that some patients may do also good, but for sure, looking at the, the ceiling effect and the consistent steady state, we cannot modulate, we cannot offer him to, to be, uh, you know, above a certain level that may be very useful during mountain bike or high risk. So the backstory here would be, um, you know, he was in a fairly um, protected environment at home. Um, wasn't really allowed to engage in a lot of really high risk activities. So uh, the concern I have with the mountain biking is, yeah, probably pedaling, normal biking activity, not a huge risk. Emicizumab would provide the protection. I'm, but I'm, I'm more concerned about, uh, you know, accidental injury, falls, etc. And I don't think he thinks about his periods of time when he's at peak levels, post dosing versus when he's at risk. So emicizumab definitely smooths out the risk profiling, but whether it provides all the protection needed for at least dealing with accidental issues. So I guess what I like about f Cog Alpha here is that at least for a long window of time, we can normalize, take hemophilia out of the equation. And he, depending on his dosing schedule, I would make him aware of the window of time when he's potentially in the normal range when he's maybe most suitable for this type of activity. Um, what do you think from a, um, are there, you know, he, he, he may have some questions, the dosing and safety considerations uh, related to uh, this and, change in management. I mean, personally, I have no concern because the dosing, it's pretty much, you know, uh, allows him to be adherent and also to, I mean, it's easy. And also for safety, uh, I think we know very well factor eight, even though these products are modified, but we know from the data that we have that there are no major safety concerns. So the concern would be if he has a big trauma during mountain biking. So yeah. I have no concern. So definitely assess the patient's PK profile, um, help him uh, un understand the concept of risk windows uh, that need to be addressed. I think we definitely take in the patient preferences here. Uh, about how he wants to be managed, and then make sure that he understands clearly the rationale and evidence for switching off a therapy that he's been on for 20 years. Uh, that we have to ha make sure that he's on board, that this makes sense for what he wants to do in life. I would just uh, do a call out here um, related to this topic of physical activity and bleeding events in people with HEMA who are on emicizumab. There is going to be a, 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 an interim analysis from this Japanese study, uh, the Subasa study. Uh, you, you can go look at that poster on uh, Monday coming up here at the meeting. So what are some um, final take-home messages we want you all to be aware of? So EHL factor eight prophylaxis can provide longer protection against bleeds compared with standard half-life and do not seem to increase the risk for inhibitors. We're overcoming the VWF imposed ceiling uh, effect further extends factor eight half-life as we've uh, shown you with the Phanisoctric alpha, alpha and the clinical outcomes from the extend study. Um, Emicizumab prophylaxis is an established standard of care but um, some newer innovations like this may address some remaining challenges uh, that are seen even with this agent. So the choice between an SHL, uh, extended half-life, or emicizumab prophylaxis really should be based on patient preferences, individual PK profiles, the treatment and adherence, patient in, uh, adherence history in the patient, as well as uh, our understanding of the supporting uh, clinical evidence. Okay, so. We did want to give you some opportunity for questions. If you have a question, you'd like to come uh, to the podium, Mike, you can go ahead and do that. Um, 
there was a few questions that came in already. So what is the best therapy to use for a person with hemophilia A who's highly active? Um, I don't think we know the answer to this. I, I, as, as dominant as emicizumab has been in our clinical practice at our center, we still have had some reservations about a few individuals where we just felt that a traditional factor prophylaxis with the time spent in the normal range was important for their bleed protection. Is that needed in every situation? I don't think so. And we need a, a additional clinical data, particularly on highly active patients on emicizumab to better inform that. Um, let, let's, uh, let's take our question here from... You know, Al, <clears throat> Alvin Schmeier, yeah. um, Cleveland, Ohio, a very nice presentation. Um, the numbers for inhibitors, what one of the numbers of patients that you've looked at have not seen a change in uh, or potential increase in inhibitors? Are we talking about large numbers or what are the real numbers? So if we if we total up all the numbers of all the registration trials for the for the EHLs on that involve switching, obviously, then we have the uh, Athen two data, which I I don't remember the exact number there, but I think it was. Um, well above 100, but I, I, I can't remember exactly what the number was. Um, and then I think there have been, at country level, large-scale switches, maybe imposed even by national health systems, that have also shown no increase in inhibitors. And then specifically, Afranis Octokawi, that's limited to the clinical trial, uh, the clinical development program to date. So again, we're still in talking about you know single hundred-digit uh, uh, numbers overall. But I, I think uh, maybe... A, I don't know, overwhelming evidence, but at least mounting evidence that there's no increase, at least in the established non-inhibitor population making a switch. Brian. Steve, nice presentation, Elena. A uh, quick question. So that, that young man who wants to do mountain biking, okay, apart from maybe getting him a girlfriend as an alternative, would you consider having giving him the BIV001 or Altuvio twice a week at a slightly lower dose than 50 AU per kilograms, which would should theoretically keep them in the normal range all week, right? I think that's a wonderful regimen. Um, I hope that in some context the payers will allow us to maybe use it in that in that capacity. Um, but I think that'll be something to hopefully be explored either in real world data or maybe even in study. Because the concept here that you're presenting is that just as we raise the trough levels with EHLs by compressing the interval, if we take one that has a very long half life and we compress the interval, we can also substantially increase the trough level. Would you also recommend that he take his prophylaxis on the days he's going mountain biking and only go mountain biking on those days? <laughs> Presumably this is going to be a weekend activity, so he can nicely choose like a Friday or Saturday morning, and he'll be covered for the whole weekend well into the beginning part of the week. Yeah. Here's a tough one. Um, what's the ideal management of a person with hemophilia in low-income uh, countries who have uh, difficult access to prophylaxis? Uh, still, I think that prophylaxis should be considered the standard of care. So even though it's difficult, uh, we have good evidence that also low-dose prophylaxis may, it's better than episodic treatment. This is, for me, the statement that should guide us. Of course, you know, having access, access to such extended life products may even help uh, those countries where the resources are limited because if we, you can improve protection using less product, this is also another way to implement the, the use of prophylaxis where there is few product. Um, I, I think this is an important question. It has to do with monitoring um, patients who are on EHLs and particularly aphanisoctocog alpha. We didn't have time today to talk about some of the assay uh, issues. Um, but this molecule does pose some challenges for your local laboratories in evaluating uh, factor levels. Um, uh, you will not be able to use um, uh, chromogenic assays in the same way uh, because of uh, alteration in the readout with this molecule, or at least you'll have to be aware of the, uh, you know, the, the fold increase to be expected from a chromogenic assay. There are some uh, reagents uh, which very favorable match the uh, labeled potency, um, for instance, actin FSL uh, works very well with the phanisoctocog alpha, and that's what its labeled potency is. But if you uh, uh, have a lab that uses actin FS or uh, some other agents, uh, this also will introduce some challenges. There's some very good papers. There's a field study that was recently published. Um, so if you want some more data on that, I would direct you to those uh, publications. Well, we have to wrap up because there is another uh, session coming in right afterwards. 
Thank you for kicking off ISTH 2023 with us. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash WEM 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi.